So hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar on high impact classroom design and our latest research. I am Ruth Bruss and I am going to um, be your presenter today. I am the Director of Innovation for Meteor Education and I, I appreciate your attendance in today's webinar. I'm going to ask you just real quick though, if I'm, throughout this webinar I may be asking you some questions and I want you to practice going to your Q&A button that you will see on your screen. And for a moment, just to make sure that it's working, will you type in for me where you are from and what is your role? What is your stake in education? If you could take a moment and go to the Q&A so I can make sure that that is um, working. Thanks. So I'm gonna begin, and I'm gonna begin by um, starting by sharing what are so the walkaways from the webinar today. So we're gonna be looking at um, information through the lens of current research. We're gonna be identifying stakeholders' needs and the implications for classroom design. We're gonna explore components of a pro-social classroom that affect classroom design. And finally, we're gonna examine learning spaces that align to high impact classroom design. So, all these, we, your walkways, by the end of our time together, you should have the current research around these three things. Many of us find that as we begin to think about those high impact classroom designs that we need to ensure that we're getting the most bang for our buck because the decisions made affect all the community, the school district leadership, the campus staff, everybody that we're working with. And creating high impact classrooms requires strategic thinking and communication to ensure all stakeholders are aware of the importance of the changes that are coming to your campus. So communication with all stakeholders is the key because our goal is to align our learning environments to mirror real world collaboration. So I want to take just a moment and look at what are some common expectations might be for a few of our stakeholders. Our first stakeholder would be our student's future employer. What we know is that employers are placing high importance on the mastery of competencies beyond basic content knowledge. And today's um, jobs require skills like innovation, communication, and digital literacy, to name a few. There's a recent report that was titled Future Work Skills 2020. It said that to be successful in the next decade, individuals will need to demonstrate foresight in navigating a rapidly shifting landscape. Our future workers, those are our students, will increasingly be called upon to continually retool the skills they need and quickly put together the right resources to develop and update these. They are the workers in the future have to be adaptable lifelong learners. Our classroom environments and designs need to mirror these new workplaces so that our students can be successful. So that's why it's so important and our employers really find it important and they're, they're a stakeholder and they wanna make sure that are we mirroring real world um, collaboration and real world environments. Another stakeholder is obviously our students. Students really want educational opportunities that fit their lifestyles. They want a new system of learning. They want that online and offline. They want it to be um, traditional, but with that real world feel. They want what's happening inside the classroom walls to replicate what's happening outside the classroom walls. They want a blend of online materials and hands-on experiences, and they want that choice and voice in their learning. Our third, our third stakeholder to consider is the teacher. Shifting um, from lecture-based approaches to more collaborative work calls for new teaching methods. And research suggests that we must move from teacher-centered to student-centered learning environments. As classrooms become more student-centered, our teachers will need to increase the amount of student workspace in the room. So teachers need specialized training and sometimes job-embedded coaching in research methods to leverage the environment in order to create that an increased student engagement. And the fourth stakeholder to consider would be your community. Your school community can encompass many different groups of people. So once you take a moment, this is your first interaction, going back to your Q&A box, and I want you to think about the community 
And I want you to write some of the groups in your area that make up your community. We got parents make up our community. Some people are saying PTA, local business owners, taxpayers, okay. Parents, administrators, retired taxpayers, okay. Board members, okay. All of those make up our community. So if they, if they are part of our community, what are some of their expectations? So I want you to look here at, at the screen. Let me get off the Q&A here. That one of their expectations for our communities is competitiveness. Schools are, lit, are feeling pressure to break down academic silos and create collaborative communities of innovative problem solvers in order to attract and retain, retain our students. So we live in a world of instant information and families have more educational choices than ever before, if you think about it. Communicating to the community that your school is working to create high impact classroom designs that creates those high impact learning environments and experiences could be very, very important to the community and be helpful. Another um, area that they are really um, focusing in on is the changing landscape. Future Ready Schools are designing spaces to support peer-to-peer, -peer, collaborative, experiential, and service-oriented pedagogies, which attract families to the community. According to the 2017 Seller and Buyers Generational Trends, 38% of all buyers have children under the age of 18, and 26% of all home buyers said the quality of the school district was a major factor in their home buying purchase. So the community is looking for the schools and making sure that they're aligned, the schools are gonna be those types of schools that new families wanna move into to their areas. And the third thing the community um, is really thinking about is safety. Not just physical safety, but intellectual, social, and emotional safety for all students through the environment, and collaborative experiences that help the community and schools work together for the benefit of future ready schools. And as we know, because of everything that's been going on in education, safety is a major concern across the country. Physical safety is extremely critical to every member of the community. However, uh, we're moving toward that more pro-social climate, and we're gonna discuss that in a moment, that helps teachers to have opportunities to interact with all students while creating that culture that allows for both intellectual, social, and emotional safety as well. So we're talking about physical safety, but also intellectual, social, and emotional. So those are our stakeholders. And as you consider these stakeholders' needs and your implications for classroom design, I want you to consider this. The classroom is the most important area in a school. It is an environment that includes various aspects such as psychological, cultural, social, and physical. It is where students and teachers spend a large amount of their time. They, meaning the designers, should create a human-centered environment that supports teaching, learning processes, and enhances students' and instructors' performance. So, it's important that the environments that we create, because our, our students are spending so much time in them, really uh, align to what our stakeholders' needs are. The Center for Enhancement of Teaching and Learning from the Georgia Institute of Technology, um, we researched from them, they gave us some things to contemplate or to think about for high impact classroom design. They said classrooms should facilitate student engagement. This includes highly accessible furnishings for all students, including those with disabilities. They should, there should be many electric outlets, multiple display and work surfaces, such as whiteboards, and comfortable furniture and other factors. Classrooms should facilitate student collaboration. This includes use of modular tables, rolling and swiveling chairs, movable tables, and more. Classrooms should facilitate connections between teachers and students. This is done in those wide aisles, both horizontally and vertically. The moving chairs and the tables mentioned previously and the multiple display boards and more. Classrooms should incorporate appropriate technology. 
And this is done with many electrical outlets, instructor stations with tablet technology, reliable network connectivity, robust lighting controls, and more. And finally, classrooms should have a flexible physical arrangement. This includes the wide aisles and movable chairs and tables, as well as the ability to recognize space for lecture, lab work, and more. So you can see there's been a lot of research around what types of classrooms really instill that collaboration, what types of classrooms really motivate our students that our students want to be in, where we are, we are really thinking about what our stakeholders are asking of us. So this leads to our media message and our mission for transforming education. Our passion and role at Media is partnering with districts and schools to help connect the dots, as you can see here, to create those high impact classrooms. The learner, as you see here, is in the center, and we utilize the relationships between methods, environments, and tools to create those high impact learning environments, and along with that, our high impact learning experiences. One of the districts that we worked with was Burnett Consolidated ISD. And we like to collect a lot of data as much as we can when we're working with um, schools and districts. And you can see here on this slide, a picture of the classrooms at, in this district before and the, what they look like after. And from this picture, you can see that it's a much more inviting environment on the bottom, in the bottom picture there. We, we asked 3,100 students to complete a survey over six campuses, 214 teachers as well. And this whole um, area, um, they worked with 11 communities. This was some of the outcomes that came from the data. 37% increase of students that indicated that the micro environment or that high impact environment assisted them in learning. 33% increase of students that indicated that the micro environment made it easy to work with other students. 20% increase of students that indicated the technology was easy to use in the classroom. And 13% increase of students that indicated that they are able to work together with other people in the classroom. So this was some really good valid data that showed that you change the, the, the learning environment, change some of the pedagogies within those environments, and you might, you can see some increase and you change the hearts and minds. What we know is this, classroom ecosystems, which mirror real world collaboration, were found to increase student learning by 20%. I want you to notice here that there, there needs to be real world collaboration and real world tasks. It's not just about the furniture you choose, but how you use that learning environment to help increase student engagement through the learning process. If you see here, the picture on the left is actually a workspace for a business. That's a business workspace. And the picture with the children is an actual media environment where we provide it both the environment as well as professional development to ensure that the experiences would be truly transformational. So you can see that we mirrored real world collaboration through the real world types of studies. Thinking on transformation, we wanna to begin to look at the pro-social classroom. At Meteor, we refer to these classrooms as pro-social, those high impact classrooms. A pro-social classroom focuses on being deliberate and intentional, including specific in, in elements, these specific elements in the learning environment. We believe there should be proximity, teachers to students and students to students. There should be intellectual, physical, and emotional safety. Inclusion, every child needs a connection to the group. Choice, we're talking about student choice. There needs to be a success element where students feel successful or if they're not successful, their failures lead to success. And it's all about production of language, showing, showing their learning, whether they write what they've learned or they speak. This is an actual picture in Sarasota of some students that are working together. You can see the proximity of these students. They're close to each other as they're learning and working together. Just looking at the picture and looking at their faces, you can tell that they feel that emotional safety. There's some physical safety there. And 
all of them are being able to add it to the conversation. We have another research to study to um, draw from, and that's from the University of Minnesota. Um, they conducted a study where one classroom was designed in a very traditional manner. They, they had rows, a front focal point, that means the teacher standing at the front. Um, they did have a whiteboard. There really wasn't any amplification. It was very lecture style. And what they did is in this uh, first classroom, with all of these rows and stuff, they put students that traditionally um, had high ACT scores. They, they would expect them to have a high ACT score. In other words, they were those students that were gonna be our high flyers. And just as a, as a side note, we all know that ACT, the Ameri American College Testing, is a high predictor of how students will do in their first year of college. The next class period, the same teacher from that classroom one who taught in that very traditional classroom moved next door to teach in the same, teaching the same content in the same subject area, but we gave them, they, gave, they were given a different environment. The students were sitting in round tables. There was group focal point. Students had screens at their desks that they were working on. There was microphones for amplification. Um, it wasn't lecture, there was more of a discussion. Um, and what they did is they took students in there that had the lowest ATC, ACT scores. In other words, those were the students that we didn't, they didn't expect to um, do so well. They could possibly have been the struggling students, but they just weren't as high as classroom one. Now keep in mind, this was the same teacher, the same curriculum, the same classroom, but I mean the same content, but the classroom was different. And their results were outstanding. This is a photo of the classroom. You can see this is the actual classroom where the teacher is not in the front of the room. You can see that there's a center a point of the proximity in the center. So no matter where the students were sitting, the teacher was able to get to them, nice wide aisles and so on. And this is what they concluded. What happened with those ACT scores? So if you look at the slide and look at the first two columns, you'll see on the left, you will see the traditional classroom with students, those were the students who were expected to have those high expect ACT scores. They scored, if you look in the pink, they scored pretty much what expected. So they were expected to score about a 78.52 and their average score was a 78.45. So no change, the expectation um, was the same. But I want you to look at the two columns on the right. Those were the results of the active classroom with the student, where the students were expected to score somewhat lower on the ACT. They actually had a 5% increase. It changed the trajectory. If you notice, they were, they were um, assuming they'd make around a 71.77%, where they actually were at a 76.49%. Now, it is fairly important here to note that the classroom environment set the tone for the change but we have to think about the setup in traditional classroom compared to the active classroom. But that alone didn't have just the impact. It's not just about putting a nice pretty classroom and, and that the students all of a sudden did better. It was the combination of the classroom environment and the changes in the student and teacher behaviors. The students were able to interact more. There was more collaboration. And the teacher changed the way she taught. So we could have changed the environment and then the teacher could still lecture. So we may not have seen these same results, but because of the environment change, the teacher actually changed the way she was teaching as well. And the results, um, as you can see, were uh, pretty significant. Let's think about pro-social components and their implications for classroom design as we think about that study. The teacher-student interactions are very critical and that proximity of the teacher to students can impact the relationship and the teacher support. When we talk about proximity, we're referring to how physically close a teacher is to a student. When teachers are physically close, they can better hear what students are talking about, they can listen for errors in thinking, and they can act as thought partners. As well, teachers can more regularly help all the students, which can lead to a stronger, more, more positive relationships. This is important because the only way that we can truly know what students are thinking, and as I said this before, is by looking at what they write or what they say. That close proximity allows a teacher to do, to do just that. 
So when we talk about a pro-social classroom, it's a classroom environment set up to promote and encourage pro-social behaviors and interactions between the teacher and students and the students to stu other students as well. Let's think about the pro-social classroom and this element, the intellectual, emotional, and social safety. Setting up classrooms with proximity in mind lets teachers have something called with itness. So if we think about it, that's taking control of your class and can be as simple as walking around. With itness is a pedagogical term that describes a teacher's continual awareness of all that is going on in the classroom and at all times. We've always said that teachers have eyes in the back of their heads and with itness is the chance to prove it. So with itness allows teachers to know what is happening and also to move, to move easily, to more easily identify and cultivate a culture of safety in the classroom. We want students to feel safe in the classroom. So and we're gonna do another little Q&A here real quick. And I want you to um, look at this question. And I want you to look at these, the, um, think about students where they are. This is where they're at now. But to get to the level that you see these students where they're comfortable speaking in front of others, how could those environments below have been unsafe for many to get them to that level? So everyone just take a moment and answer that question. How can the environments be unsafe for many? And go ahead in your Q&A and a and then I'll call out what some of you share. Okay, no one wants to be in the front of the classroom. Speaking in front of others can be very intimidating. If they're not comfortable, they haven't had practice. Okay, if we don't set them up for success, teachers need to set them up for success. Okay. Okay, so how can we help students develop resilience? How can we set them up for success by addressing the intellectual, emotional, and safe, social safety in our classroom design? One way that it can be addressed is through scaffolding experiences, and we can also set up an environment that allows for various zones. We're gonna discuss those zones in a minute, but let's look for, at an actual environment that was built for social and emotional um, safety. This is an actual um, example of a real world secondary leadership academy outside of Dallas. This all boys classroom comprised primarily of African American and Latino boys in a leadership academy setting, setting created a variety of safe spaces for students of different needs. If you see, the image of the same classroom shows how students can be scaffolded to gain confidence. Instead of just throwing them in front of someone they have to speak, there's that scaffolding. And it helps them to develop resilience and, and those presentation skills that they need. You can see that students in this classroom can work alone without distraction. They have those solo places. This is especially important, think about it, for autistic students and, and students with ADHD. Students can then progress to small groups where they might um, work one-on-one -on -one, um, with presentations. Um, and then finally, they can move maybe once per quarter to where they give really full classroom presentations. What they're doing is this classroom was setting students up so that they would start out working solo until they, they, they got to the point where they were um, collaborating and sharing with the larger audience. That's how we help students to have that emotional, intellectual, and social safety. We don't want students to feel um, that, we, that everyone just has to immediately stand up. We have to give them opportunities to practice that. Collaborate, collaborative structures for collaborative task is the key. We have, students need to talk and they have to be able to share their ideas. It, it, they have to be able to discuss what they're talking about. That's the first step. In our world where the loudest voice often wins, it is critical that teachers play, um, put systems into place that easily allow for true collaboration where students are not only engaged, but they're learning critical skills about how to listen, how to think critically, those 21st century um, skills of being able to create and share in ways that we don't often see in just a traditional type of task. And think about it, is there any better way to learn? This type of learning encourages students to not only feel like they're a part of something, but it's to recognize the power of their own ideas and also show that their ideas can shift and evolve through exposure to the ideas of others. 
Collaborative tasks may not come naturally at first to students. It, it, some students are so used to sitting in rows and doing things by themselves. But we as teachers and educators have to begin to set up those classrooms where students have that opportunity to practice that, those collaborative skills. And again, with scaffolding, if that is what's needed. And remember, it can greatly increase students' intellectual and emotional safety with some guidance. And this is part of that pro-social classroom. In the pro-social classroom, two of the components, inclusion and choice, are directly related to authentic inquiry and um, collaborative tasks. Authentic in inquiry or inquiry <laughs> includes who, who, who's included. All students have a connection to the group and a role or responsibility within the group, as well as they have some student choice and voice. Instead, think of it instead of just being passengers on the curricular journey that maybe the teacher mapped out, students are valued participants and their voice and their choice matter when helping to set the curricular agenda and take the wheels themselves. The teacher has to ensure that students have the resources they need and they are there to facilitate if needed, but authentic inquiry turns students into the researchers. Let's look at, um, just for a moment, at the components of classroom environments that support inquiry. This comes from a Galileo organization, and you'll notice that as I read the supports, they directly align to the research I shared with you earlier. So the first thing is that um, teaching and learning environments should replicate the conditions in which real life researchers and other experts work. We wanna replicate those. The work at hand dictates what needs to be done and the standards to which it must be completed. Projects are authentic, worth doing and fit within the overall direction of learning. So remember when I talked about classroom ecosystems that mirror real world collaboration were found to increase student learning, this aligns directly in, in, in with that, that um, research. Secondly, learning environments are mobile and flexible. Students and teachers work together face-to-face -to -face and online and with other students and experts from outside the classroom digital resources can easily be assessed. Think about what we talked about earlier. Students want those educational opportunities that fit their lifestyles. We talked about that when we, we talked about them as our stakeholders. They want a new system of learning, online and offline. They want, they want what's happening in the classroom to replicate what's happening beyond the four walls of the classroom. And finally, what is learned and how it is learned changes. Students must have access to robust and academically rigorous content to create new knowledge. They do this by analyzing and synthesizing information, posing problems in ambiguous situations, interpreting content, defending solutions and points of view, and designing, constructing, and evaluating their way through a product and our project. And this really aligns to what um, I, we were talking about before when we're talking about that, ch that student choice and voice. So it's interesting as you think about the pro-social classroom, we really, all those elements really align beautifully as we, we lead our students to support in, in a collaborative or an inquiry-based classroom. So up to this point in our webinar, we have discussed key stakeholders for change, why we need to focus on changed environments, and the components for a pro-social classroom that can affect our classroom design. We're gonna spend the remainder, the little bit of time we have left of our time examining design elements within various learning spaces that will align to high impact classroom design. According to a study on the impact of classroom design on pupils learning, um, there are six design aspects that affect classroom design and student learning. And you can see here what they are, color, complexity, choice, flexibility, connections, and light. I'm gonna give you a little bit more information on each of them, the research behind these, these aspects. So the aspect of color refers to color of the walls, floors, furniture, and the visual displays in the classrooms, and if they provide appropriate visual stimulation. We've learned that upperclassmen prefer warmer colors in the classroom, while younger students desire those cooler colors and they want brighter classrooms and environments. Study after study has concluded that there is a direct correlation between the physical characteristics of the learning environment 
and educational outcomes. So the use of color in school design is an element that affects more than the aesthetics of the building. Um, a researcher named Kathy Engelbrecht, she was a noted educational planner. She feels that we have to be sensitive to each grade age group's different responses to color in order to create those environments that's going to enhance their educational experience. So we want to, we want to keep that in mind. Another study is that in West German, a West German study uh, was, was looking at all the different colors and they stated that white walls in the workplace, and they did this study in the workplace, but think about this in conjunction that if our classrooms are to mirror real world um, situations, so we want our classrooms to mirror those workplaces. So if you're thinking about white walls in the works, um, they found that white walls in the workplace resulted in findings that um, termed the environment as being neutral, the environment was sterile, empty, and without vita vitality. That's with the white walls. Psychologically, white has nothing to offer and is often viewed as the cause of eye strain and fatigue. I find that interesting because I think about all the classrooms that I walk and the majority of them, the walls are white. So what they suggested is that um, you might want to think about some different colors on your walls. They said that red is interpreted as a warm or hot and can generate feelings of energy, excitement, or threat, and it appears to improve focus and performance. Orange is interpreted as warm or hot, and it invites friendliness, stimulates critical thinking and memory. Yellow is interpreted as warm or hot, and it can make us feel happy and inspires creativity. Green is interpreted as cool or cold, and it appears to be relaxing, but if overdone, it can lead to feelings of stress. So you've gotta be careful with that. Blue is interpreted as cool or cold, cold, and it stimulates creativity and can produce a state of calm. And so it, but we, again, we wanna be careful about um, too much of excess. The key is knowing what's gonna happen in the environment. And I thought it was very interesting looking at this, that if you think about in our media centers and some of our, our specific like makerspace and things, things that are happening in there, we want in the makerspace, we want students to start thinking to be critical thinkers. We also want to inspire creativity. So we want to think about the colors of those walls that might help with that. Okay, our, another element is complexity and it refers to an appropriate level of stimulation without being cluttered within the space. So additionally, larger buildings can accommodate diverse opportunities for alternative learning activities. So according to a study in San Francisco from the Color Studio, they said that one problem in our classroom is that a lot of our teachers hang so many things on the walls that classrooms can become complete visual chaos. She says that it's important to try to have an orderly and organized room to reduce the amount of nervousness and anxiety in our students. And depending on the, the space, teachers can utilize both form and function, such as the Lego wall here that you see in this picture. Choice has to do with the equality of the furniture in the classroom. So we've been, we talked a little bit about furniture earlier, as well as the comfort and providing choices of interesting and ergonomic tables and chairs. Flexible seating is the key for students as well, depending on what they need that day or what's best for the type of task that they're gonna be completing. You can see in this picture here, some students are working alone, some are um, working together. So it just depends, some are standing up, some are sitting down. Wanna give that, that choice. Flexi um, um, flexibility should recognize a diversity of learners, a diversity of content and a diversity of teaching styles. So classrooms should include zones to support varied learning activities and allow the teacher to easily change the configuration. So this ties into um, some research on learning zones and their places in classroom design. And I want you to think about that all boys school where I said that they had to work through the, the up to the big presentation. They go, they start out with this, the one um, where they're by themselves and move into the one on one, working together, uh, small groups and ultimately sharing. That, those are learning zones. Let's look a little bit um, more in depth of what I mean by learning zones on this next slide. Okay, I love these classroom spaces. This is just a, a kind of an easy way of thinking about it. So we have the campfire sta um, space, and this is really a space where people gather to learn from an expert. Um, if you think about it, this would be where 
Um, the experts are not only the teachers, in the, but they could be guest speakers. They could also be students so that we help them to feel empowered and share their learning. So we want to have an area in our, in our classroom that we might call the campfire. We may want to have an area that we consider like the watering hall. And that is the, um, it's an informal space where peers can share information and discoveries. It can act as both learner and teacher um, simultaneously. This shared space can serve as an incubator for ideas and can promote a sense of shared culture. And think about the watering hole or kind of think about um, in the office fit offices where they go around the water um, and they, they have conversation or the coffee room or all that, where, where it's called the watering hole. And then we have the cave. The cave is a private space where an individual can think, reflect, and transform learning from external knowledge to internal belief. The swamp is the place we go when we are stuck and need some help to get out. This can be a teacher small group area, an individual workshop area um, where uh, students are requesting groups. Um, it could be led by an expert or a teacher, or and it, and it, it, in some instances, even a student expert can help in the swamp. And lastly, the last place to consider is maybe a, an area called the Plains. And this reminds me of like kind of Friday spelling tests where I was a child and instead of um, rows of teachers, we got to spread out because we, we didn't have a way to like separate ourselves from other students. But um, I've seen teachers do that. But we want to go a little bit deeper with that. This is really where we think about um, going beyond a cave space. But it's for everyone that they're still working independently, but they're spread out wherever they need to work and what's best for them for the tasks that they're doing. Another element to consider is the connection. And this refers to encouraging opportunities for interaction between students and between students and teachers. Clear ways, um, clear clear walkways and clear corridors ease the movement of students. And you can see in this picture here that this teacher is easily able to facilitate in multiple groups. She's not having to try to wedge her way in between chairs or such. And students are student to student there as, as well. This will remind you of that pro-social component, which is proximity. And our last design aspect is light. This concerns the amount of natural light in the classroom as well as the quality of the electrical lighting used. Um, light is very important, but natural light can sometimes be a precious commodity, as we all know, in the, in the school building. I've been in a lot of schools where there's no windows in the classroom. So in my experience, light has played a role in the, the amb ambience that I liked. I always asked for the classroom that had a lot of windows and because it makes things a little bit more cheery. So sometimes, um, even when I had those lots of windows, I still had kids that didn't want all that light. So they would ask me to leave off the lights or to uh, block the blinds. And that's fine too, but you wanna be able to have some choice if possible. So as we conclude examining this area of learning spaces and elements for design, we wanted, I wanna give you some information. This is the research and it's kind of our own internal research. And this is research and really what we did is ask our, some key stakeholders. We asked our students, what is it that you want? You know, go to the source, go to those that are gonna be the main people sitting in those classrooms. And this was some common responses from students of what they said. If you look here on the side where, of the, where it's on the left, this is the type of, um, this is what they want it to do. This was what they said they want it to be able to do together. They want it to be able to work and learn together. They want it to learn better. They felt they learned better from one another. They would prefer no more than four students per group anymore, and they said they couldn't get along. They want to be challenged, not bored, and they would prefer hands-on um, activities. So that, that was what they asked for as far as um, the experiences in the classroom. On the right, this is what they said they wanted as far as the environment, because we're trying to align those experiences with the environment. They wanted a welcoming front entrance. This was a group of students that were getting ready to get a new school. They wanted lots of windows with a beautiful view outside because looking outside helped them think. This was their, their response. They wanted chairs with rollers to help them collaborate. Tables with a solid, even top so they could work on a project and their materials didn't fall off. They wanted places to work outside of their classroom. They felt like they were always stuck in a classroom from you know first bell to last bell. And one of the quotes from a student was, by last period, after sitting all day in these classrooms full of furniture with no windows and no view, I can't breathe. 
So this comes straight, straight out of the mouth of babes of how they feel they want those experiences and the environment to look. And taking in mind what they said really aligned to all of the research that I just shared with you. So as we conclude our webinar, I wanna leave you with three deliberate actions to consider. I want you to maybe consider walking your campuses or your school to identify some pro-social components that currently exist or any gaps that you might have so you can have further conversations with key stakeholders. Perhaps you could assess your current learning environments and determine one or two immediate actions that could impact student learning. Or you could share this information with stakeholders and have an internal conversation, um, bring people in, talk about some of the research, talk about where would our students would um, be? What would, what would be their answers? What did they want? What, do, what are their needs? How, are, how do they best learn? So hopefully this has been um, helpful and it's given you some food for thought on some things that you can do. So I'm going to conclude that um, if you have any questions, I'm going to spend, I'm going to allow you, um, you can go ahead and go and type into the Q&A box any questions you might have and I'll uh, um, try to answer them. If you would prefer to be contacted by someone, you can um, jot that down in the Q&A. If you want more information, you can just jot down your name and an email address and just say, I'd like more information. Um, I'd like to be able to share this webinar with, with some of my colleagues. Um, or if you would prefer to email and not put it in the Q&A, you can contact Sebastian Sanchez at ssanchez at meteoreducation.com and he'll get back with you and provide you information from one of our learning environment specialists or um, from one of um, our design designers or whoever it is that you'd like to talk to. So hopefully this has been um, helpful and it's given you some research and some um, food for thought. Well, thank you. We look forward to, um, hopefully you'll be able to make our next webinar in the next two weeks. And I thank you for your time and have a great evening.